I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, everybody, welcome. Alice, can you do a roll call for us? Beretta? Here. Aronowski? Here. Vandermeer? Deskin? Here. Turner? Here. Smith? Here. Colorelli? Here. Capadona? Six present. All right, thank you, Alice. All right, a couple things before we get into it. Uh, on the mayor's report, Ben, can you talk a little bit about, uh, we all know going over the 9th Street Bridge is awful. It's like we sit on that bridge forever. I don't even go visit my mother-in-law anymore. That's my excuse, because the bridge is <laughs> great. Um, but it's really unbearable. Uh, the Division Street Bridge being closed down made the 9th Street Bridge you know, a problem. It's gotten a little better, but we have been actually trying to work with IDOT. Do you want to just speak to that a little bit, Ben? Sure. Th thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, we, we have been working with IDOT. Um, we have requested them to um, study the traffic signal times. Um, they wanted to wait uh, until the Division Street Bridge was completed. They wanted to wait until the 13th Street signal was completed. They don't want any variances um, open while they're trying to study that. Um, now that those are completed, I just spoke to them again um, this week. They are in the process of, of starting that study. It'll take about a month before they evaluate all the traffic times and hopefully make some adjustments that will um, alleviate some of the pressure across the big bridge. Uh, the good news is we also had some complaints about the pedestrian um, button signals. Um, they did come out and take a look at those this week and adjusted them and gave them an additional two seconds to get across um, 9th Street. So hopefully, it doesn't sound like a lot, but I, hopefully when you're moving in your strides, two seconds will be enough to help you get across to the other side. So, okay. um, yeah, so we are getting some some uh, response from IDOT on those issues. Okay, good. Yeah, hopefully we can get the, the light length in a little bit. And, Chief, you've worked with the bus companies a little bit in the schools. You just want to speak to that for a moment? We called, uh, um, we called PACE, we called the high school buses, and uh, asked them if they would consider rerouting their eastbound buses that are coming from 53 onto uh, Canal and then over to division the buses that are going south and everybody was very cooperative so i was hoping to see a reduction in buses crossing uh state street from the bridge okay and you know one of the problems of course is do the buses come up to that railroad crossing that to completely stop open their door you know the school buses and so i'm um, asking them to take the uh division street route so anything we could do to try to you know loosen up some of these issues we're working on it so hopefully we'll see some some changes in uh in that a little bit oh and by the way one of the things i'm going to do in january and is uh where's t-rex is he here tom you're out there i don't have my glasses on yeah, he's there. I saw him. where's he at thought i saw him yeah the um you know one of the things i want to try to do is work with some of the other mayors and get a um and i've talked to them briefly about this about getting a coalition together working with the will county governmental league and uh um, the CED about um, really starting to put some pressure on um, the Bruce Road, Caton Farm Bridge. It, uh, it's been talked about for years. Everybody wants to do it, but then everybody <laughs> just kind of nods their head and then walks away. So I just, if we can get some political will behind it, and one of the reasons um, I'm glad Tom is on board with us, he knows all these characters, and so helping to form a coalition, I think we're going to try to move forward with that in January. So we'll see where it goes. Maybe we can lengthen it from 20 years in the future to 10. So I don't know. Just one question. Yeah. Um, this is in regards to Galgar Road. Do we have any any um, time frame? Uh, we don't. Uh, I think we did speak about this at the last meeting or two ago that um, Gaga Road is still shut down with the um, construction out there in ML. We are involved with a condemnation case with the county. Um, right now, that case is going through its process. Um, not expecting that to open anytime soon, but hopefully by spring we'll have that all. Yeah, we've been working with uh, Mike and Steve, our county commissioners on the other end, so they're aware of the issue. And then, uh, Pam, you had some news at Lockport Square. What's going on? Mm. Um, yes, on Friday afternoon, uh, Lockport Square submitted for their first outlet development, which oh. is uh, Lot 7. Uh, it's a multi-tenant building. At this point, uh, five tenants, about 12,000 square feet. Uh, staff has completed their um, initial review and comments were sent out today. Uh, we're targeting the January 20th meeting, which means the council should see them shortly thereafter. Okay. No, that's great. I mean, I know that uh, 
nothing to write home about when it's an outlot. But um, the truth is, you know, every broker and every person in the industry I talk to, they're like, you, you just need to get the momentum going. And so getting some momentum opened up would be a good, a good thing. There's actually a number of junior anchors that are very interested and lined up and wanting to come out to Lockport Square. The problem is they're all, you know, they want to know what the anchors are. And, and like, look, it, part of what we've been trying to convince them is we already have an anchor. It's called Walmart. And we have the Jewel Plaza. And all these buildings will be contiguous off of that. So, you know, waiting for Target to pull their head out of their keisters, you know, we can do that until we're blue in the face. Let's, let's get rolling. So, um, Fortunately, we'll see some things go vertical, though, at least in the outlets in the spring, and, and we'll, keep, uh, we'll keep up the pressure. So thanks, Pam, for that. Uh, one more thing, too, is uh, in January, I'd like to do a couple um, public outreaches. I'm going to do coffee um, at New Vibe at 10 a.m. on January 10th. So if anybody just wants to come out and just, you know, a little more informal setting. And then also do kind of a town hall meeting on January 29th. And we'll just do that up here um, at 7 p.m. So try to give people opportunities, whether it's on a weekend or in a Thursday evening, uh, to come out. So that's, again, it's um, January 29th at 7 p.m. here, or it's uh, January 10th at 10 a.m. at New Vibe. So either one, if you guys can make it out, you got questions, concerns, grapes, uh, whatever, it's a perfect time to come out in a setting that's uh, a lot more informal. So. All right, so that's that. We'll move on. Pam, you want to, uh, I think you have the first item on the, uh, oh no, city clerk, what do you got? Um, I just have a memo in regards to the schedule of meetings and being published. Um, it's basically just informational that Donna prepared. Okay. Is this something we need to put on an uh, agenda in the future? Or um, no, it's just informational. Okay. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alice. You're welcome. Uh, Pam, what do you got? Between in, in the 
center of the building to kind of give the perception that it was two buildings when I think that it was one. Um, the setback was, I believe, about 12 feet is what they proposed. Uh, one of the planning commission's members expressed that perhaps if the coloring of that section of the building was more of a darker shade, that it would further help to uh, mitigate the impact of one larger building versus two smaller buildings. In addition to that, several of the members expressed that there should perhaps be some additional setback put in that building to help again offset the massive disadvantage of the building. Uh, staff recommended that incorporate a design element again to break up the mass, which in essence is what the first two conditions uh, that the commission added. Uh, we also talked about adding a landscaper four foot or more right along the west side of the property. And this is to provide um, a 20 foot landscape separation between the trail and any parking and dry aisles. When the original plan was approved, the trail was always there, but there was no parking on that side. But now with the addition of the parking on the left side, we feel that an additional buffer needs to be provided to separate the path from the drive aisles of the property. Um, they'll have to submit final building elevations, which will include our required mechanical equipment screens. The concept plan would be valid for one year from date of any approval, and all the terms of the annexation and rezoning were in effect today. So, Staff has asked for direction to place this on the January 7th City Council agenda for action. Um, at this point, if you were to move it forward with the, any of the conditions we talk about today, they would be automatic in, your, um, in any future decisions. And then if you wanted to add additional things tonight or at the time of the action, that would also be added. Yeah. All right. Any discussion? I just like to thank Christiana for her time yesterday. She showed me the plans and the setbacks and the additional screenings and parking. So, thanks. Uh, the applicant's representative, are here to and I believe would also like to. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. If you guys want to speak first, and then we can have a discussion up here. Good evening, Russ Whitaker. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Lesnov and Whitaker. Uh, in Naperville. Uh, if you don't want to hear me speak, I'm happy to just say yeah, sitting just down, though. Speak out. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, a, Pam went through uh, a lot of the details. We've been working with Pam and Christiana uh, closely as we went through plan, uh, plan commission. I uh, had a bit of feedback at plan commission. I think a lot of it is things that we're, uh, we're happy to work on and incorporate in plans uh, as we move forward to a formal submittal uh, pending uh, approval from you this evening. Um, one thing that Pam didn't mention that I think is worthwhile for your consideration is Panatoni is contract purchaser of all 50 acres, uh, so they would be purchasing the site in whole. Um, the property, all of the site infrastructure was originally planned to go in in two phases. Uh, Pam did look to come in and put all of the site infrastructure in in a single phase. Uh, that is an enormous investment. Um, today, site infrastructure is actually located opposite of 355. So they will be uh, bringing all of that infrastructure, uh, municipal utilities under 355, bringing it all the way through the property from 159th up to 163rd. Uh, that's about a $7 million investment just in infrastructure. Um, I think that's important from the village perspective because that opens the door to uh, additional development to the east of this property. Without those utilities, that can't happen. So this is sort of a... Uh, a domino to fall for additional uh, additional properties to come into play for the village. Um, the other the other thing is uh, Panatoni's contract to purchase the property is absolutely contingent uh, on the approval of the revised concept plan. They are very much focused on that first building uh, or the first two buildings along 163rd being combined. Um, they see from a market perspective that being an absolute necessity. Uh, at the plan commission meeting, we talked a little bit about why. Uh, some other buildings on the market that have languished that have similar conditions where they don't have immediate access onto a public right-of-way. Uh, the other issue is that they have a prospective user uh, that they're looking for uh, on the building along 163rd. That user requires the size uh, that we're coming in uh, with for that proposed building. That's 250,000 square feet plus. Uh, the good news is that's an office headquarters warehouse type user. Uh, we would anticipate that they'd have 80 to 100 jobs that they'd be bringing to Lockport. Uh, certainly helps uh, accounts that you're looking for to bring in an acre tenant at nearby commercial. Um, so we think it's an exciting development, huge investment uh, here in town, new jobs, new property taxes, uh, new development opportunities by the extension of utilities. 
Um, if you have additional questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We have PowerPoint. I know you've got in your packets, you've got all the slides that we presented at Planning Commission. I'd be happy to walk through any of the detail, elevations, landscape, et cetera. Um, if anybody feels it's necessary, that's fine. Otherwise, we can, uh, if you want to go, do you want to go through the PowerPoint or do you just want to, have you looked through it already? I, I just had a question. Okay. Um, no, I, I, from the drawings and everything, I, I think I'm fine without a PowerPoint, but maybe the audience might want it. I don't know. Um, but you show there is only one ingress and egress. Is that correct on the far east side? Yeah. That, I, then I was wondering what this little doohickey is coming off 163rd that it's a white line that goes all around the property. That, what is that? That's the path that Pam referenced. Oh, that's the walking bike path? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I don't need the PowerPoint. I sat down with Christiana yeah. yesterday. Yeah, and I understand. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Why you want the one building, the, even legal problems that could have, you know, come up. Uh, there's a, most of these are car parking that we see and the trucks that go into the south side except for the last building where they go in the north side. It, that's and correct. What's a drive-in? What's a drive-in? I didn't, I mean it said you're going to have drive-ins but it didn't really, I don't sure. know what that is. Sure. The So all of the parking that's depicted on the site plan um, that, that I, I have up here um, is vehicular parking that would be office employee type parking. Uh -huh. If you were to look closely um, at some of the other detailed plans, um, where we get to the back of the building, um, there's some opportunities for, um, for vehicular access into the building. Um, there's a couple spots. The, the bottom elevation here is the rear of the building. So you see your typical loading dock in this location. Here, there's a couple of breaks in the building. Those represent where the building might want to be demised uh, for individual tenants. And there would be a, a vehicular entry there where a, built, where a oh, okay. vehicle could enter the building. I can. I was at the planning commission meeting, and I concur with staff and the planning commission uh, recommendations. Kelly, you got anything? I'm good. Okay. The, the only one question I have is uh, uh, the spoils from the building construction. Are they going to be stored on site, or are they going to be removed right we away? Yeah, we haven't done any engineering associated with this as of yet. So once we get past the, the concept plan approval, we would do full engineering of the site. Even when the original development approvals came through, they hadn't done preliminary engineering. So I don't know that we, we actually know how the site balances at this point in time. So I don't know if there's uh, a stockpile or not. It's something we'll have we to look at. We can talk about that later, then that's fine. Thanks. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Pete, you got anything? Yeah, just um, <clears throat> not for the concept plan, but just for you and for staff to be ready as we move forward. You know, one of the concerns I'll have is the strain that this development will have on the um, adjacent roadways that lead to the interstate and so um, as we move forward with the planning just keep that in mind that probably every council member on here is going to want to have some answers as to you know what, when your tenants start signing on what kind of truck traffic we're going to see what kind of uh, uh, passenger vehicle traffic we're going to see those sorts of things and what the city is going to be doing to prepare for for that as the roadways around that area deteriorate at a, at a more quick pace uh, because of it. Yeah, and there's, there's an annexation agreement on the property that dates back to 2009. That the, the good news here is that is all spelled out in some pretty specific detail in the annexation agreement. There are a number of obligations that go to, uh, that would go to Panatoni as the purchaser of the property to improve roads, so we can provide that detail as we move along. Thank you. Okay. Well, Russ, thanks for uh, taking the time. And uh, y y you're right about its, its effect on other things. I know when I've talked to the retail components and even like I was talking to sweet tomatoes you know what do I got to do to get a sweet tomatoes out here and they ask me you know what's your lunch crowd look like and so the more of these are industrial properties that are zoned that way begin to build out the more opportunities we have for those kinds of businesses so I know those are things that we all uh, look for here in Lockport so these will only help so appreciate your time um, recommend that uh, we put it on the council meeting uh, 
was it January 7th we're doing this next meeting? For January 7th for an action. Okay. All right, what else you got, Pam? Before you guys start, I just want to <clears throat> give everyone an understanding of how this works. I understand this is, and the council is very aware, this is one of those projects that has created a lot of anxiety in the development. And so while oftentimes residents come up and they speak, you know, they have a five-minute time frame, um, Michelle Paulus has agreed to speak on behalf of these folks, and I told her she can have as much time as necessary instead of pigeonhole, you know, to five minutes. So. After Mr. Antonopoulos speaks, Michelle will speak a little bit, and then uh, I, I'm open also for John to get back up. I, I wanna make sure we have open discussion here. I don't want anybody to feel like they're railroaded, and uh, so I wanna be as open as possible with this. So, John, if you wanna present. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is John Antonopoulos. Uh, I represent the uh, Broken Arrow Golf Course. Um, I just, I want this, the council to understand, this is not an opportunity just to make more money. This is, this is a, an attempt to survive. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you are golfers and you know what's going on in the industry today. Uh, in 2014, uh, there were 18 golf courses that were built and there were 157 closed. Uh, the closings 
Of those closings, 66% charge less than $40 to play a round of golf during peak time. John, sorry, is that statewide or national? This is national, nationwide, yes. And in 2006, there were 643 golf courses that were closed. So this is the time of, of an evolution of a change of golfing that we've never seen before. We always saw golf courses being built one after another. So this is, this is a problem, and what we don't want to happen is what happened with our neighbors at Homer Glen, where the Woodbine Golf Course was forced to close and the municipality ended up taking it over. So again, it's not an attempt to make more money, but we're struggling. The par three course that we're talking about um, was built back in, what, 2000, 2000? And uh, during the last five years, uh, they probably had virtually no play on the golf course whatsoever, and they've been maintaining it. So it's been an economic strain uh, on, the, on the golf course. During the last few years, uh, we have been meeting with the planning staff, we've been meeting with the residents. This isn't a plan we just threw out at the plan commission and said, we want. Through a series of meetings and negotiations with the homeowners, in fact, the homeowners that we met with the first time were concerned with the proximity of the proposed townhouses. It's too close, we're gonna see them. So we went back to the drawing board and we moved all of the townhouses closer to the golf course and we're gonna maintain the existing buffer. The berms are not gonna be disturbed whatsoever. Now, when we met with the homeowners, there were all kinds of accusations thrown out. Um, the biggest one was drainage, that the golf course caused all these drainage problems. Well, in the mayoral, has to, because we met with the mayor, we met with uh, Mr. Uh, Greenan, who was the uh, superintendent of public works for how many years, 30 years, uh, Ron? Mike Greenan? And he unequivocally indicated, after reviewing his notes and after reviewing all the minutes of the meetings, that the drainage problems of the adjoining property owners were drainage problems that were created by either the builder, by the developer, or the homeowners themselves. The drainage unequivocally was not caused by the golf course. When the golf course was approached to help out the situation, the golf course agreed to donate money, agreed to donate time, and they agreed to donate some landscaping material, and totally cooperated with the city. There is no, I mean, there is no indication of whatsoever that the golf course ever refused to cooperate and do their share in helping the problem that wasn't even caused by them. The second problem that was raised by some of the residents, and again, people throw these statements out, so now we're caused to, to try and defend them, was that uh, by building this single family uh, development, we're gonna cause uh, students to be transferred to other schools. I have a letter that's part of the staff from Mr. Lavelle, who's the business superintendent of the uh, school district, uh, Homer Communities Consolidated School District, indicated that approximately 16 students would be generated by this development. And the building could accommodate 100 students. So there is virtually no impact whatsoever on the school district. So that argument is totally unfounded. And the final item that was, the, was a concern was traffic. Um, we are in the process, and I apologize, we don't have the results uh, from the traffic engineer. We will have a traffic study that will be completed in time for, if you approve, so we can go to the next step, and uh, the traffic study will be available. Um, as to the plan commission's concern, we've met with the engineer, i met with the Chin family, and with respect to the variances, we are pretty confident we can accommodate every single recommendation of the plan commission, almost every one. First one was the size of the lots. We can increase the size of the lots. The uh, lot width, we can increase the size of the lot widths from 70 to 75. The rear yard setbacks, they wanted to be larger. We could encroach into the open space area if, they, if you want and make the larger lots longer. The front yard setbacks, we could, we could eliminate that variance. Uh, so any variance that they requested would be eliminated. The only variance that we have a problem with, and that is the configuration of the site, is the length of the cul-de-sac. There's only one way to get in. We can't make the cul-de-sac any, any shorter because of the configuration of the property. Um, I mean, we're, we're here, and as I have explained this to the Chen family, this is a concept plan. This does not mean it's approved, and I, they completely understand that, but we need an indication as to whether or not we should spend more money and go through this exercise and do some preliminary engineering, final engineering, and move, 
to the next step. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm here. Uh, our um, engineering consultant from Rutger and Tenali is here, Mr. Hammer, and Michael Chen, uh, one of the owners of the golf course, is also here. Do you guys want to ask questions now, or do you want to wait till we hear residents? Wait for uh, the resident, okay. Michelle. Michelle, why don't you come up? Hello. Okay. All right. As I spoke at the last meeting, my name is Michelle Polis. I live on in Arrowhead subdivision, and I actually live directly on the Par 3 golf course. Um, we just like to talk, the only, would you like us to address our question? They, they said something. You said the PAR 3 hasn't been making money. I think the PAR 3 has been closed for the past three years. Is that? Did you close I mean, is that it not, because you weren't making money or? Are you I mean, but to say that it hasn't been making money, it hasn't been open. I mean, I think that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, it I hasn't been taken care of or. I would just confirm, did you guys close it because it wasn't making money? So it was closed because it wasn't making money. And when was that closed? About five years ago. Oh, five years ago. Okay. And when was it built? Okay. Um, I know there's been a lot of different discussions. We understand the fact that it's a concept plan. We're going to just, these are a lot of people's different disagreements or oppositions. So I'm just going to present it as everyone's so you all know. One of the things that they're talking about is the overcrowding. And I know that. There has been talk to Homer 33C and there's been talk to the different schools that there wouldn't be an issue. You may not know that there is an overcrowding issue. Currently for the high school alone, there's three students to each bus seat to going out of Broken Air. My son attends high school there. There is an issue with adding more residents to this. It's just gonna provide a bigger issue. I understand that maybe you're not gonna be moved to another school, but there still is a crowding issue that occurs at Lockport High School. As residents that live directly on the par three golf course, a higher premium was paid for these lots when the home was originally built. I mean, that needs to be taken into account. These people paid to live on the golf course. Why does that get taken away from them for someone else to have golf course living? I mean, at what point does the residents that currently live there that paid that premium, or even myself when I purchased my house in 2007, I purchased the home to live on the golf course. I mean, at some point, that needs to come into play here, that someone else of these other homes should not get that advantage that we're not going to have any longer. We've been paying higher property taxes since we live on the golf course. Not the fact it's because our property is worth more money. USA Today and CNBC did a, a study about things that make your property taxes going up, and there are nine issues with golf course with the things that make your property taxes going up. And the ninth issue is golf course living. The location of your land is an important component of your home's valuation and taxes. So we've already been paying that to be on the golf course. The same reason that the golf course gets a tax break. They are considered an open space land. Each year, the golf course has to go to Will County to ask for a special permit to have an open space. They do not pay a high premium to having that golf course there. They pay for open space. All these things need to be taken into effect when we're looking at this. The city of Lockport just incurred the cost last year in 2013 to repay Broken Arrow Drive with construction traffic that according to the attorney for Broken Arrow on the October 20th meeting, this plan is, is projected to take years why would we damage an area that's already been fixed at our cost? According to the city's accountant, she was unable to break out the cost factor for that particular area, but we know that this was just fixed. Um, some concerns that were also brought would be the street bond and how that would work regarding if this project were ever to come into play. In 2007, the city of Lockport incurred the cost regarding the homes that border the Par 3 golf course in a huge drainage problem. I understand that this drainage problem has been, there's been some different talks of who was in charge, who was the problem with it. The big thing to understand is that in 2007 it was fixed. In 1991, when the project was originally approved, the golf course has been there for years. Why did it take till 2007? The reason, the big thing was, is when Broken Arrow changed the practice range to a par three golf course, there, was, there were things that were changed. You can't deny it. The city incurred the cost, I don't know if you know, of $25,000 to 
That does not include the cost that residents had for living in these areas for years to drain their own yards. We have residents that had their graduation parties that had to purchase special pumps to get the water out of their yard. I understand that they think that that wasn't their issue. There are pictures that we have here that people brought over to Broken Arrow and they just said that that was not their problem. At some point, the city did get involved and we are appreciative of that. It has been fixed. The same sense is that we don't want to see another problem happening again with this. We have talked to different residents of the community and we have a petition that we will be presenting here today that they do not want to see any more development in this area. We have 220 residents right now of Arrowhead that have signed this petition stating they do not want to see development of the Broken Arrow. You are constituents of our area. This needs to come into play. 220 people, this is one business that wants to make a change. We are the people that you need to be representing also. One of the biggest issues that came up were the safety concerns regarding the concept plan, regarding the egress. Um, I'd like to talk about this. There are some issues regarding that the city of Lockport and Broken Arrow, do we want to add additional traffic? With the park being on Broken Arrow Drive, I don't know how many of you know this area well, Broken Arrow Drive is one long street. On the corner of one of it is a small park that is actually owned from the city of Lockport. Going down, you go all the way down into the golf course. Are we going to be adding, and there's only a sidewalk on one side of the street too, so everyone understands that. There's a safety concern for all ages <laughs> regarding this. I know there's been talk of adding stop signs or some speed bump type things. There's still a safety concern of adding more residents to this area. There is a chance of increased chances of drinking and driving, adding a banquet facility to this area. There are 400 residential dwellings in Arrowhead alone. Do we want to add an additional chance of a drinking and driving situation to possibly happen? The big thing that we are the most concerned about is the egress. Arrowhead subdivision has only the access road to the neighborhood, is the only access road to Farrell. Already at peak traffic times, traffic is backed up on both sides of Broken Arrow Drive and Farrell, prohibiting entry to the homes. Additional traffic may either further prevent police, fire, and other emergency vehicles from gaining access to the city, citizens in event of emergency. Rezoning would increase traffic con congestion on the public streets and decrease traffic flow. One of the things that was brought up at the meeting that we had over at Broken Arrow, and Robert Peretta actually brought it up, that on the day of the voting, people were unable to get to Broken Arrow because, I don't remember, was there an, they were fixing the streets at that time. People could not even go vote. That is one small example. I would hate to see the city council be behind if there was a major accident and my house is on fire and someone cannot get to me because there's one egress road into our subdivision. According to the planning and zoning memora memorandum dated October 9th, the city planner stated under access, today's standards wouldn't allow one ingress egress for a, sub for a subdivision. Understanding that the original zoning included a hotel and banquet facility with only one ingress egress, that should be immaterial in voting for approval on this. We should follow the standards of today and look at this project as a new project and acknowledge the concern per the city planner of having one entrance into this subdivision. We are requesting city council to table voting and or discussion of this concept plan because of the egress issue. We have been talking to civil engineers in neighboring cities to find out their ordinances and rules regarding subdivisions and the egress issue. Per the city of Lockport, the Arrowhead subdivision has 400 residential dwellings. We have emailed over 50 cities and are just getting all the information together right now. I would like to recap the following three city responses that we feel are the closest to us. Orland Park, according to their city planner, they have an ordinance that would not allow a long circulus road with one point of access would not be permitted. There are also ordinances that require stubbing and or connecting into neighboring stubs to continue the established roadworks. Orland Park stated the developer of a 400 unit residential dwelling would be hard pressed to <laughs> adequately address life safety and other emergency concerns. There is one developed city that we all know. Next is New Lenox. Jeffrey Smith, the city planner of the city of New Lenox, stated they do not have an ordinance, but the city of New Lenox would require a secondary point of ingress or egress into a subdivision of this size. 
The biggest is Joliet, and I know there's some people currently that sit with the city council that are from Joliet. I talked to Jim Trisna, the public works director of the city block of Joliet. He has been with the city since 1987. This is a direct quote that I asked him. There is no subdivision of this size in Joliet that has one egress. The one subdivision within Joliet that does have one access point is Sunset Ridge, and they only have 80 residential dwellings. We have 400 residential dwellings. This subdivision is 20% the size of Arrowhead. He stated there is not an ordinance in Joliet, but the safety concerned with emergency vehicles and traffic would constitute two to four access points. He gave the example that in 2004, Newman Builders built the new Fairfield subdivision and have 250 residential dwellings and they have two access points and they are set up for future access points. As Lockport becomes a larger development, a developing city, these issues should be looked at very seriously. There's a major safety concern that should constitute the city council to oppose any concept plan that would add to this problem. We are already past what should be there. We can't change that. We can't change having another entrance, but we cannot add additional cars, additional dwellings to this area. As the mayor said, he wants to work with other mayors. This is the opportunity to learn from other cities what they have done to make their city develop. As you know, Orland Park, New Lenox, and Joliet, we would only hope that we would have as much commercial property as they have. At the opening of the meeting, when Broker Arrow, Broken Arrow presented their concept plan to the neighbors, a resident addressed Mr. Chen if he'd be willing to add another access road. He told us, no, I am not willing to tear up my golf course. The safety concern is legitimate and should override any and all concept plans to this area. The city of Lockport needs to address this before any concept plan is approved. The current situation would need another egress ingress for the subdivision, let alone adding any additional housing or people. We are willing to meet with any member of city council to present the facts that we have currently presented and we will be continued to get more. This is a major issue, a major safety issue that we know that this city would not want to be involved in. As I've demonstrated, there is absolutely no compelling reason to consider the acceptance of this concept plan that will result in a zoning change. The major concern should be foremost in consideration of turning down this concept plan are property values decreasing, city money that was already spent regarding the problems with the par three golf course and the drainage issues, safety issues regarding all residents, including but not limited to the entrance. The area was never considered for residential property and should not be considered for in the future. I strongly urge you to do what's best for the citizens of Lockport by opposing this concept plan thus preserving the character of our neighborhood and the safety of our residents. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I mean, I have a few questions, but John, do you want to respond to anything? Uh, by the way, she did a very, very thorough job. Uh, I appreciate all your comments. Uh, it, it's true traffic is an issue. I mean, I think that's the only real issue. I mean, we've addressed the schools, we've addressed the drainage, and they're really not issues. Uh, there's nothing we can do about the constraints of the property. It's an existing facility, um, and we're going to have to work within, within those parameters. We have hired a consulting uh, engineer to do a traffic study, and we're going to demonstrate to the council that the impact is going to be minimal, if any. We're talking about 16 kids that are going to be generated by this development. This development was originally designed, don't forget, for a convention center or a hotel in a, in a, in a practice range. So the, the amount of people that are going to be using these facilities are not going to be that greater as, as compared to what was originally designed for the, for the street system. Um, but I, again, I, I can't argue with what you're saying that if this was a new development, I would agree. But this is not a new development. It's an existing development that we're trying to preserve and to try and enhance uh, and create some value there so that uh, the, the golf course can continue to be uh, profitable and we can put a, uh, a nice banquet facility in there that will be a complement to the community. Yeah, let me ask you a question. The, um, I mean, you, one of the reasons this got tabled till now was because I had questions about the flooding and who was responsible. It was a concern of mine. Um, when we brought Mr. Green in, in to kind of uh, get to the bottom of it, uh, I understand that by the time we were done talking, it seemed apparent that the flooding issues were didn't have anything to do with the um, 
the berm that was put up. That was my big concern, that they put a berm up and it flooded everybody out. That's correct. Um, apparently those things were, it was a swale, and there was the way sub pumps were out, and they trenched it, and that was fine. When the berm went up, it aggravated the problem, but the Chens immediately addressed it. So that's fine. But what, correct me if I'm wrong, is what I've, from what I've heard now is that did this go back further? Was this a driving range once, and then it was converted to a par three, and that's it was when it happened? It was never yes. I don't want to become, Mr. Shen, you want to come up? I mean, yeah. if anybody would know. <clears throat> it was a driving range prior to the short links, and so it was never a problem. It was a driving range prior to the short links, and so we have dealt with city as far as the, the concerns of the neighbors, and so um, back then at 2005, 2007, so we did address that issue, and a lot of the issues was back then from when the buildings, from the houses that was, was built, um, with all the, all the waters that was coming through, it actually caused a problem, so we tried to help Obviously, try to help the city, try to help the neighbors, trying to make sure that problems doesn't exist. And obviously, we took care of that issue in 2007. There was money that was donated from us, and there's also labor that was being helped from our golf course um, to the neighbors and to the city project. Right, but the way I understood it, you're talking to Mr. Green, and that had to do with the berm. But was there an issue? And the reason I'm asking these questions is because it's just kind of getting a feeling for how there's a lot of changes that need to happen here. A lot of Variances, a lot of stuff that needs to go down in order to make this happen. And so I just want to make sure that if it goes in that direction, that this will be, problems will be taken care of and not blown off. And so that, that's why I'm asking these questions. So what I'm trying to understand now is when the par three, because what I'm hearing what Michelle said is that when it became a, went from a driving range to a par three, that that's what caused the problem. And is, that's what I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. When I only went with Mr. Green and back as far as the berm, I didn't realize there was a, a change in the usage from driving range to par three before that that may have aggravated the problem and may not have been addressed. That's what I'm trying to figure out now. And maybe that's a question that really can't be figured out right now. I have a feeling I have to bring up Mr. Green and again and go back and get some minutes from earlier. Well, I mean, if you remember our meeting with Mr. Green, and he indicated that uh, the adjoining property <coughs> owners had an open swale. They did not have storm sewers. The water would drain from their sump pumps. The water would drain from their lots, drain into the swale, and the swale wasn't properly graded, and water would pond. Yeah. So when, when they built the golf course, uh, it, pro it, it, it created a berm, okay? So the, the, the prop water could not go off their property. Yeah. So what happened is that they had something called ward money, whatever that is, that each ward had a, had a certain amount of money that they could use, and a point, somebody put the ward money into helping these homeowners out. They eliminated their drainage problem, put in, then these people connected their, their downspouts and their storm sewers into the storm sewer, and the problem is gone. I mean, so, part of, and that, so I guess part of this comes in, and, and you know, Michelle, you touch on this with the fact that, you know, like, oh, nobody would build a, a development with one egress anymore, I and mean, it's true. They also wouldn't build swales without proper drainage. And so when it became an aggravated problem, it's like the city did it just because it had to be dealt with, not just because there was, I think, um, uh, negligence. It was more just because back in the day when they first built it, they didn't have it. I didn't have sewers on my street once upon a time. So they just, it's, all right. Are there any circumstances? Can I ask that question? Maybe that's they no. said 2000, wasn't it? 2000, right. That's, that's, be, that's because the work, that's because, that's because the storm sewers were not installed until 2007. When the storm sewers, when the storm sewers were installed. Water for seven years in our backyard. So you're saying there was no water problems before it was changed from a driving range? Not a Mayor, can I bring in one issue? Uh, uh, one issue on this, uh, you're talking about converting uh, open land to, uh, to housing. You know, when I first came on the city council, I learned something that I had never known before, and that's that roofs cause flooding. And the only reason roofs cause flooding is because they're now covering up that ground with a hard surface that's not, that doesn't, uh, that water doesn't penetrate. And one thing that open land does is actually absorb water. And um, the, the problem is, is not necessarily, in my eyes, is not necessarily the past flooding, but now you're gonna convert open land to roofed land, and that, that will cause 
um, that may, if there's a, an equilibrium right now, that may change it. And, it. and it may actually cause flooding in the future. With, I with don't all, know. With all due respects, uh, we're going to be putting in a big drainage detention area, yeah. and all the water is going to go into that. We have Rudiger and Tonelli here who will design this so that there will be absolutely no runoff uh, to increase the flow of water off the site whatsoever. Uh, and, and we're going to leave that, ber that berm that is between those residents. That berm is going to stay there. Right. They're, they're, we're not going to disrupt that in any way at all. And I understand that. We've had developments before where the engineering was great for the development, but we still had flooding. <laughs> I know. So, well, I mean, I, if you're going to get there, I'll, you, if we could be so paranoid, we'll never approve anything no, in this I, city. I agree. I'm just bringing that point up. Right. Yeah, okay. Can I uh, say a few words? I, I think I uh, just wanted to say a few words. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, and I think. I mean, just please, everybody just ask your question. I think uh, one of the main issues that I've observed, even going back to the October 20th meeting, is obviously there's a lack of trust between both parties because of what happened. Here we hear it tonight. We have a scenario where the business is stating, well, we just aggravated the problem because the problem existed where we have homeowners, everything was fine until the berms were in put into the area and when the berms were put in and then they experienced uh, the flooding. So I think we could go back and forth with that, but you know, here's, here's the main issue. The flooding started to occur when the berms were put in. And if I lived on Apache, being one of those 11 homeowners, I would think the, exactly the same thing. Everything was fine until the berms were put in. Well, that's, that's not I, entirely true though, Bob, because that's the thing that I said on with Greena, because I was concerned about this. It's, the, the, there was, flooding, the swells were fixed, they put a proper drainage in. When the berms were put in, it did aggravate the problem, but the Chens immediately addressed it. It wasn't like, hey, we're going to wait seven years, and, and they put their hand right, up. Sure. No. But see, here's, here, hang on, hang on, Michelle. It was built in 2000, yeah. and it wasn't fixed. Yeah. No, no, the berms, when did the berms go in, guys? I no. had... 2000. So 2000, you put the berms in? I had uh, Ron do some research, and I don't know if this is still your findings, but a few weeks ago, as I was working with Ron, he went back, worked with staff to see how much was contributed. And even in early November, I even mentioned to you, Mike, how much was contributed. I think you found a check for $2,000 mm -hmm. to, to address what the city put in, and then the, the golf course contributed $2,000. So that's the information that, that staff uh, found out as far as you know what was contributed from well, from Broken was, Arrow. But I don't know if I, I gave you Alderman Peretta, but I, I, there was further correspondence other than the two thousand dollars, which they contributed uh, some of the landscaping and the removal of the soil, and they attributed that to be about eight thousand two hundred ninety dollars. Okay. And with the two thousand, originally the contract was for like twenty thousand. And, and what, what essentially happened is, there, the way I reconstructed it, was essentially there was some, uh, the city took this job on its own. They had city crews do it. And then after it was done, it still, some of the homeowners felt that there was still a problem there. So they went back and re-landscaped. And, and that's, that's where the additional money came in. So, I mean, Originally, it was a, a city project, um, and you're right, it was, it was about 20,000, 25,000, but the, the Chens did contribute, you know, 2,000, but they also did some, uh, with their crews, some, you know, some help, putting landscaping, taking care of removal of the soil. They attributed that to be about $8,500, $9,000, so the total was was 10,000 and the thought was, you know, that was a partial contribution. Now, well, granted, that, that didn't solve all the problems. That's when the landscaper was, was, was hired to, to change some of the area there. That's well, what I and, and I guess the bottom line is, because we can harp on this all night, the, 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 the bottom on my biggest issue is that it's a trust issue. And so, you know, my feeling on this, by the way, is I'm okay going forward with the concept plan because it's a concept plan. All the things that Michelle, who represents the residents, had to say are going to be addressed. And if they can't be addressed, then so be it. They can't. Um, so I have no problem telling a business, hey, man, go f see if you can make this work. It's your dime. Um, I'm all for supporting business. I'm all for seeing this golf course flourish. And so, 
but there's a, a pretty heavy list here that has to be gone through. Um, but the trust, it's just a trust thing. And so just so you guys understand that, that's kind of a little bit of one of the, one of the hurdles that have to be overcome. And so that's the only reason I really bring it up is mainly like, you know, I, I, I'm not looking forward to getting in the middle of something that's a problem caused and it wasn't us. That, that's just not gonna fly here in the future if this project eventually does get approved or not. Those kinds of things are not gonna be satisfactory answers, you know, if I'm still sitting up here. So that's why I bring it up. So instead of going back and forth on the flooding, because it I does sound wanna, like it's been addressed. I say one other thing, and I think maybe Amy can address that. I mean, there was an evolution of drainage and the means to take care of drainage in the city of Lockport. Original subdivisions between probably 91 to about 2000, the only drainage in the rear was a single drainage area in the rear. We've had pro we had problems with all, all the subdivisions that we did that. So what did we revert to? We got catch basins, we got stormwater drains. We even, after that, we had problems. And after that, we required that the, that the um, sump pump lines be connected to the, the stormwater drain. So, I mean, it is, that was an ongoing problem, an ongoing evolution. I think, Amy, that we went from open ditches to um, uh, the stormwater lines in the back, and I think that, that in essence, helped solve the problem. I'm not saying that was the full problem here, but it certainly was an issue. Good so we had uh, Kelvin Grove that had sheet drainage using the street. But right. Um, right? The, the, the only uh, other um, thing that I have a question about is the, uh, is the access. That, you know, are there two entrances? Can people get in and out? And this is a pretty large thing. And that, that's going to be my concern. Yeah, and and it, I think if I'm hearing everyone correctly on both sides, uh, that's one area that everyone could agree upon. That is an issue is just having that one road going in and out we, we will have it we will have a traffic study done by a professional engineer for for the planning commission meeting for sure mm -hmm. and i did give that example on october 20th Michelle, there's a lot of things cities wouldn't allow. They wouldn't allow our entire subdivision I live in to be built the way it's built right now. We don't have the proper setbacks. We don't have the proper sewers. Why would we make a safety concern more? It's part of... It's on record. Do because you want it's, someone coming back to you and being like, my house was on fire and they couldn't get there? Michelle, I get that with every project that goes on in our old downtown. If, if we're going to do it right, the entire downtown should be raised to the ground and rebuilt. That happens all the time. We do it. We add additional things all the time, but we have to make amends. We every time we have a new building, every time a new business goes in, they have to meet codes. They have to do things. If the Chens can find a way to make this work, God bless them. But if they can't, then they can't. But the idea that we're gonna—I mean, it's we're a mature city. We're not a new city. We're not New Lenox that's building an old farm and new, you know, farm fields and making new subdivisions. Of course, we wouldn't build it this way now. But it doesn't mean that, you know, the whole world comes to a halt. Yeah, I mean, the traffic studies, I guess the thing is, is that you're saying that they wouldn't do it right now, and you agree with that, but let's add more homes to it. Like, it just, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And I think that that's where we're coming in at, mm -hmm. is there isn't another entrance. We can't go back. We can't say, you know what, we should add another one. There's nothing we can do about it now. But why would we add additional amounts of people, a banquet facility, a cultural, why would we do that? And I hope the city council here is looking at that sure. to be able to say, we're not going to vote for that. That doesn't make sense. Well, Michelle, I also have to look at the entire city as well. Having a failed golf course in the middle of our town is also not going to do well. It's going to hurt everything else we're doing. But and the folks and the folks that don't live in your part of the neighborhood, the folks that might live on other areas of the golf course, they also bought on a golf course. And to live on an empty field, that may not be what they're interested in. Not talking about golf course. Yeah, we changing the par three, which per his thing has been already closed for five years. Right, they're talking which about it so that they can. On. Is that correct? Do you have outdoor weddings on that? So you actually use part of the par three 
country right now. Yeah. So I guess the thing is, is you're talking about a small parcel of land that we're talking about. We're talking about that there's an issue, there's an entrance issue that's been addressed by other cities. We are continually getting more things that other cities wouldn't allow it. And our own city planner said it wouldn't be allowed. Correct. But I just think that those things have to come into play looking at this. Yes, it's, it's they wouldn't do it today. And like I said, we wouldn't build buildings the way we build them in our downtown today either. But we have them, so we have to address them. And my other concern is the viability of Broken Arrow Golf Course. I don't want to see it close. I don't want to see an empty field. And if it becomes an empty field one day, it's not going to be turned into a prairie. It's going to get sold. Somebody's going to put homes in it. It's not going to just be, you know, a, a nature preserve. My desire is to make sure that the Chens can stay in business so we can keep a, uh, a, a golf course and a bank facility in our town as we have it now. They're telling us that they have to try to make a business decision to keep it open. If they're going to have to go through this list, which is a difficult list, it's a challenging list. I, I, I'm not arguing that at all. I don't think neither is that. But if that's what it's going to take to keep the business viable, I am all for looking at this and seeing if they can make that happen. As far as, um, let's say, hypothetically, the concept plan gets approved, is there a time frame you're looking at on when you want all the architectural drawings to be complete? Once we get the concept approval, we could then move to the preliminary uh, engineering stage, balancing utilities and uh, doing the engineering studies. At that time, we would probably bring in and again, we're not going to bring in pretty pictures of what houses are going to look like. Staff has recommended architectural standards, brick fronts, uh, comparable to what's there, you know, comparable to what's there now, for sure. And the reason why I'm asking for a time frame, uh, you might get one answer from a council today, but there's an election coming up. The council could look totally different. So you might start spending money on architectural drawings and then it could be for nothing. It's just a thought. It's, it's always a risk that you run, absolutely. But again, we're on a time constraint. Uh, this, has been, this has been in the process two years. With the Chins have spent an enormous amount of money on architects, engineers. We first of all came in, we were going to put townhouses that were going to be much denser than they wanted to put in condominiums. And now we've got townhouses that have been spread out. And based upon what the staff's recommendations are, we're going to lose quite a few lots now. And the density is not going to be as great. It's going to have to be smaller because we're going to have to have more open space. So. And again, we're going to provide an engineering study that hopefully will satisfy the residents and yourself that, that the impact is minimal. Yeah, and as far as uh, the schools, and I saw the memo from uh, John Lavelle, 33C, but we also have permits in Oak Creek. And, you know, growth is good for a city, uh, but it has to be done, you know, properly and, and planned correctly also. So and it, it's, it's and a balancing act. the facility is going to be a big plus for the community. I mean... And without the townhouses, the banquet facility can't be built. That's, there, that's an economic balance that has to be taken into consideration. So I, I understand the plight that all of you are in, and we're just asking for your consideration to move us on to the next step, and we can, we'll have to demonstrate to you that we've, we've met the design criteria, we've met the staff's concern, the planning commission's concerns, and if we don't, uh, then shame on us. And I want to speak for every single resident in, in Broken Arrow, but I did hear from... Uh, two or three residents where they say, well, why can't they just build like an executive single family type, you know, $400,000, $500,000 kind of homes, you know, to reduce the density. So I heard that as far as consideration, you know, from some of the residents. Can I speak? Yeah, of course, please. Uh, when I first saw this plan, before I heard from anybody else, I, I looked at it and I called Ben and I said, there's no way that I can support this plan because of your 1,300 foot cul-de-sac. That goes against code, that's almost triple what our codes call for, for cul-de-sacs. And if there is any kind of a problem, a fire, uh, you know, murder, shootings, whatever, and somebody gets in the way, you've got a terrible situation there. Now, I know that you've said you put in an access road for the fire department because the fire department right. wasn't right. happy with that either. But you're going to have that blocked off in case if, if the fire department has to get there. And then it's going to come in emergency. at the, yeah, at, it, at the um, cul-de-sac 
area of the street. I just think that that's just a terrible idea. I also agree, I've been drive through Broken Arrow, the Arrowhead subdivision there. It's a maze of streets. You know, you can get lost in there. You've got people, you wanna have banquet facility? I don't know who's gonna know. I don't see banquet facilities placed in the middle of big housing developments and who's gonna know it's there. How are you gonna know it's there? We have banquet facilities there for the last how many years? Uh, last 19 years. Last 19 years, so. Yeah, it's a clubhouse that has to, you know, with the people you're talking, I'm assuming you're talking of something like Denolfo that you want, that that's the kind of activity. If this is just a clubhouse, a banquet facility for the people that live there, okay. But I agree that adding more houses to a 400 home development with one ingress and one egress is just waiting for a catastrophe to happen. And I don't see any reason for putting more houses in there. It's not like Lockport needs more rooftops. We still have developments that are being developed. And you're the one that changed to the par three golf course. I don't play golf. So, you know, I don't really know anything much about it, but I live in a community where there's lots of golfers, and so I talked to a few of them and asked about this par three. And they said it was a terrible course, which is probably the reason you closed it, because people didn't want to pay it, play it. But they do go and play your regular courses. So as far as I can tell, you didn't keep it up. You didn't make it a nice playable course. So you, did, you lost, so you didn't keep it up. Uh, the, with all these other issues you say that you're going to, all these variances, I mean, we've had issues with not granting variances before, and then you come with all these, now you say, okay, well, we're gonna work around, and we're gonna give you everything, except the cul-de-sac is not negotiable. We have to have a 1,300-foot cul-de-sac. To me, that's just a crazy uh, thing, and I don't see that we should put 400 homes and put all those people add to their chances of having a major catastrophe if something happened and that subdivision had to exit it's it's just crazy to allow more housing in there okay anybody else yes um, I'm gonna have a little bit different perspective on some of the comments um, I encourage everybody who lives in Broken Arrow to drive by my home on their way home today. My address is 1650 East Street. You get there, you go to the five corners on Division Street and take a right. Two blocks on the left-hand side of the road is a house. There'll be a, a blue uh, Jeep Liberty in the driveway, a big rock in the yard. But I want you to look to, to the, your right and you're going to see an apartment complex. And that apartment complex has been there for a long time, long before my house was built. <coughs> there, I, th I believe that there are 11 buildings. And every building has four tenants, four separate dwellings. The parking lot for the um, complex opens up into my driveway. Now I had a concern when I bought my house back in March of 1993 that I wondered what the impact, what's this impact uh, gonna be in my life? And I found out since March of 1993 that there hasn't been any impact. Now directly across the street on Roseanne are, I don't know, six, seven, eight townhomes, duplexes. They don't look as good as what we see here, but once again, there's, there's people living there. Now, when I bought my house, two subdivisions did not exist. Immediately, no more than a blink of an eye south of me was where East Street ended. It ended in a barricade. 
and directly, and so if you, where that is, is you look where the pine trees are on, off of Briggs Street. And it came to a, a, a barricade. It was great because it was a cornfield or a soybean field, and that's where the dog that I had at the time, we would go ahead and we would, I'd take the dog there after work, and he'd run around and had a good time. And then in the mid-1990s, Pine Valley, and when that was built, they, ha they, they included a road, Parkview Road, which intersected with, with East Street, and that's the road that you take over to Lawrence Avenue, which it, it opens right up into the, the uh, Park District. And I am absolutely positive that many people in this town have used my street to go from Division Street down to Parkview, take a right, and go to the Park District. And then after, after Pine Valley was built, Newberry Bit Ridge was built a couple years later. So what we have here immediately, as I look out my front door, I see apartments, I see townhomes. Over on Mihalich line Drive, I see two duplexes. And immediately over the top, tops of those, I see, I see four townhome complexes with eight, with eight townhomes in each of the complexes. So when we're talking traffic, I've got traffic. My driveway opens up into East Street. Now, when I built my house, there were a bunch of young people. We all had kids. And we never had an episode. We never had an incident. So I have to judge the what could happen versus my experience over 22 years of what has happened. And I respect the could happens, but I have to go, I hope you respect my point of view, which is I know what has happened. Absolutely, I think the issue is, is that other cities have seen the need to have these entrances put in. And there's so, no but that's not what we're talking, we're talking traffic, increased traffic, yes, We, we can say that about any street anywhere in the United States. So do we not do anything? No, I'm, I'm asked, I'm, I'm, well, the question is, 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 is I, no, I'm not treating like you're stupid. I am, I, am, I am giving you my objective point of view over 22 years of observations of out my front door. So. <laughs> No. So the question here is, he is, he is he, the, the developer is asking to bring residential. It is zoned R1 right now. The issue is, is he going to get an R2 zoning? That's the issue. It's it, open space. How do you count it? The entire area is zoned R1. That's how I know. So, so we have to allow him due process. And due process is, is to go from point A and to have them go and bring a preliminary plan. If that preliminary plan does not have adequate engineering, and if it doesn't have a decrease in the, in the amount of lots, like as was recommended by the Blighted Planning Commission, then it's not going to get through the Planning Commission, and it's not even going to get here. But I don't believe that we have, we deny somebody due process because somebody, people say like that. It's, it's because everything that comes before us in, in a, in a, uh, any type of development of any kind, there's always somebody that objects, objects to it. And if we go ahead and, and go ahead and not do anything based upon objections, then, then, then we are what we are. We just we just stay the way we are, and nothing happens. So, I, I 
I have no idea what, what, what the issue is, is with, with, uh, with a concept plan, going forward with a concept plan. I would, so we can get, to the, get the answers to the questions that we all want, which is the engineering, the drainage, the traffic studies, that we can't get any, any of those answers unless we go forward. Mayor, I'll summarize my opinion quickly. Um, when we talk about traffic, in the 1980s, I was a technical advisor for the Illinois Department of Transportation. We did traffic studies. The, um, the most heavily used road is an expressway with uh, 2,000 cars an hour per lane. Now, if you, the average household in this area probably has two cars per household. So if you have 440, you have 880. Now, the other problem is, is that what we're talking about here is inconveniencing a lot of people. And I think that uh, if we add anything new, um, that our job is not to in inconvenience people that are already there. And I think that uh, with the uh, safety issue of fire, with the safety issue of if there's, a, if there's a road construction and there's only one lane out of there, that's really gonna be a nightmare. And those are, I understand those are all the ifs, but I think that until the uh, developer puts in another um, entrance to the uh, subdivision, I don't think it works at all because I think it inconveniences the existing residents of Lockport. And when you in, and when we do that, why are we doing that? I don't I don't see the reason for doing that. So, thank you, Mayor. Okay, Brian, you got anything? I do. Thanks. Um, heard a lot of discussions here today. First, I'd like to uh, say thanks to the Chens for doing business in Lockport. I, we I appreciate that, and uh, we do hope your business does do well in the future. So I, I'd like to say that first, okay? Um, I'd like to say thanks to Michelle and her comments. You're very passionate, and we appreciate that and your thoughts and the work you put in that, too. So I thank you. However, there's some topic here that, that reading the Planning Commission minutes that uh, there's a lot here. So again, Commission uh, did talk about the variances that they were concerned with um, those also to our mind uh, as far as what they had so again I would be definitely looking to make those corrections and you had stated it sounds like you're willing to work with them Absolutely. so no question about it. yeah and so I know a few of them really did stick out in my mind and I thought you know they they really need to be addressed so I and it sounds like staffs with that too so um, We talked also too, we talked about trust and, and again, I didn't know all this conversation back and forth, trust and I mean, really heard that word today. And so I hope, you know, there's some, some bonding we can do in that and, and work something out and as far as all that goes. So again, uh, those are some of the things briefly that uh, came to my mind. Again, there's a lot in here that was already talked about. So I, I don't want to re reiterate on those again. Um, um, but again, I, I think it's important, and I don't know where you're at as far as I know you want to move forward and all this stuff, but I think it's important that you bring a developer in. I think it's important you move forward with a developer. I think probably for your interests and for our city staff and our interests too. So I think that's important to recognize. I think maybe you need to do a developer too, bring that forward. So that kind of gives us, I think, a little bit better feeling as far as our staff to, uh, to work with and know what's going on. So. I think those, with those in comments, uh, I wish you the best, and uh, hopefully we can get somewhere. Hey, you got anything? Yeah, just um, I just want to be clear on the uh, question for John on the variances. Um, th there were several mentioned at the Planned Commission meeting. Um, and for the record, we talked about you working on them, but have you have you and, and the Chens agreed to? Um, comply with the driveway widths, the landscape ratios, every single one of those variances you're willing to modify your plan? Okay. We've talked to uh, Rudy Antonelli and they are working diligently making the plan work so that we eliminate the variances. Okay. okay. Lot sizes? Yep. Front. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Got it. Okay, I want to be clear on that. Um, the, uh, the, the other point I'd like to make is um, I think it's um, important to note the concerns of the residents. I, you know, there's... Uh, all of the, the concerns that they brought forward today are absolutely valid. If I lived in their subdivision, I'd have the same concerns with my family and traffic and um, you know everything else that they, they talked about today. But um, I also know that at this phase, it's, um, as, as an elected official, we need to consider um, very carefully those residents' concerns, but we also have to um, consider uh, what's best for 
uh, the business owner that's bringing his proposal or her proposal forward, and also what's best for the for the city. And um, one of the one of the items that was highlighted today, which I think is an important one, is um, you know increased um, options for dining and entertainment and things like that. Those people who are trying to bring those things to the city, want to see households, and, and that helps. This sort of thing, I think, would help with that. Um, the the uh, clubhouse that was discussed, it is used as a, as a banquet facility currently. It's called a clubhouse, but I've been to numerous events and, you know, for outside organizations. So it, for all intents and purposes, it is used for the, that purpose. And, you know, I've seen the parking lot when it's packed, and there is a lot of traffic that comes out of there already. But I think in the end, um, it wouldn't be fair for us not to move forward. I think if, if, our, if our responsibility is to consider the residents and consider the city and consider the, the property owner and their wants and needs, I don't, I, I don't think it's responsible to deny it at this stage without having all of those, all of the information that we can have to really consider the, the uh, proposal thoughtfully. So um, I think it goes to Darren's point that this is about due process. And, and part of that, I think, would be to address the concerns that Denise had about that, that 1,300 uh, foot cul-de-sac, you know, talking to the fire department. I know that um, Sunset Ridge is another subdivision here in, in Lockport that has uh, one entryway in. I don't know if you're familiar with that one right, right off of Galga Road, but they also have those emergency vehicle access points with the chain um, blockades uh, that, that can allow the fire department to get in if necessary, since it is a one way in, one way out. So I'd, I'd like to hear about, I'd like to hear those things. I'd like to, um, you know, once, once we have, I think, all that information, then the council could make a better decision as to whether or not this is, is the right thing for, to move our city forward or if it's going to hurt our residents to the extent that it wouldn't be good for the city. But I'm sensitive to the mayor's concerns as well. If, you know, we have to, we have to look to a certain extent of what might happen in the future, and, and the residents are right to do that, but also the city must as well. And uh, the city be concerned about what happens to your property if, if you can no longer sustain your business and um, and so that that wouldn't be good for the city that wouldn't uh, I don't think it would be good for the residents either because the alternative could be uh, much more um, housing and traffic and all those other things that happen so it was an eye-opener to me actually here tonight to hear that the initial design uh, when we when the city it was before my time but when the city was considering um, the, the the plans for for the 400 unit subdivision initially that there was a plan for a hotel convention center I did not know that so I just want that you've said it I just want to see evidence of that so that I know that that's the case because that means a lot to me that means that this kind of development that you have that you're talking about here today isn't too dissimilar from that and so if if it was possible to do something back then with the roadways it might be possible to do it today. So I just, I want to see that first without just taking your word for it. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Could I add, I just want to what peak, because obviously he didn't. Um, it's my understanding that uh, this subdivision was built and approved before it was annexed into the city of Lockport. The city of Lockport had nothing to do with the plans and that was how you got, there got to be the um, only one ingress and egress. That that is, is entirely wrong. Really? Yes. I thought I had read that. Back that then, I mean, in 1990, this, this was a, a plan that was approved by the city council, uh, right or wrong, for one street in. Uh, well, I'm going to have to go and back and look because I thought I read that, council, that it but wasn't. probably would have been approved by the city of Joliet and Homer Township as well who was also fighting for this project. You know, and, and just one more point too, uh, for the residents, and I respect the fact that you have a number of people here and, and have signed a petition, obviously, so that means a lot, but I did just, this is just a um, interesting instance that happened. I was at my kid's uh, Christmas play, and I ran into a, a guy I graduated high school with, and I hadn't seen him in 10 years, and, um, and I found out he lived in Broken Arrow, so I asked him, I said, hey, what do you think about that? Um, concept plan that, that's coming up and he, and he said oh, he didn't really know much about it so he said oh what is it and I said well it's going to be a bunch of townhomes and there's going to be a um, banquet hall and he said oh that's great uh, you know we need more commercial Lockport and I was surprised by that response but it, I, the only reason I bring that up is I know that 
th there are differing opinions within the subdivision. And, you know, his, of course, he, I, in his backyard actually backs, I asked him where he lived because his backyard backs up to Broken Arrow Drive. He lives on Seneca. And um, so, and he wasn't really concerned about all that. And so, just for your information, just so you know, the right. conversation I had. So basically what will happen here is um, we will vote the next meeting We'll put this on as what's called an action item. So tonight, we're just going to look to put it on as an action item, because uh, what we do in Committee of the Whole, this meeting that we're doing right now is where we discuss these issues. So the vote for whether we approve a concept plan will happen on is it January 7th, this is what we would do if we put it on for an action item. So just so the residents are aware of how this works. Um, so there's not actually a vote on it tonight. Excuse me, but an action item is... Okay, that's not, yeah, never mind. So we'll be able to, yeah. uh, there's, that's when it'll take place. And again, you know, I understand that this is, this is gonna be a tough challenge for the Chens. It's gonna be like threading a needle at a full run. It's not an easy thing with all the concerns, but uh, yeah, my, my feeling is, uh, you know, it's, it's due diligence, man. If you guys can, you know, make it work, that's fine. I'm not gonna give you the hand at this, point. I think it would be disingenuous to, um, to the process and, and businesses and people who, who want to operate within the city. So in any case, we'll put it on for an action item for the January 7th. Um, folks, I do appreciate your um, concern. Michelle, thank you for being the voice of everyone. I do, and I want to reiterate that you do represent a number of people. This isn't just your voice. I asked you to <laughs> take, and so we didn't have 50 people up here at five minutes. So I, I, I would like to say, Michelle, I would be happy to meet with you at my friend Cindy's house. You know, okay, and yeah, okay. I, I just, I just would hope that the fact that all these other areas, the entrance issue has to be addressed. Yeah. You know. So can I, I can I hold on to these for a minute? Can I hold on to these? these uh, they're mine. I will send you copies. Okay. okay. Because the Chens already have it. Okay. So Michelle, I'll set that. Up. I'll, I'll, I will set that up with Cindy sometime after, yeah. sometime before the. Seventh, okay. All right. All right. All right, folks. All right. Uh, then what do you got? You want to take a one-minute break, or you want to just keep going? You guys need a break, or you want to just stop? Break? Just right, finish up. We only have a couple uh, things. Yeah. Right Amy's like capping her wrist. What the heck? I know I saw it somewhere. Let's go. Cool. It dispersed on me. What am I supposed to do? All right. All right. Sorry about the long break. Uh, ben, what do you got? Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, a request for an increase in the stipend amount uh, for the plan uh, commission members um, in an ordinance. The current ordinance we have, um, they do receive a $60 stipend per meeting for every regular and special meeting that they attend. Um, that was approved back in 2006. Some uh, budget discussions in the last year and a half. Uh, a couple of the council members had asked me about uh, the potential for increasing that. Um, we did uh, put those appropriations into the budget um, for 2015. And so I'm coming to you tonight to find out if uh, this additional increase. Um, basically, you're going from $60 to $100. That'd be a $40 increase. Um, you know, full transparency, that'll cost the city about $3,360 a year. Um, but we do feel that they do put in um, their due diligence and their time, not just attending the meetings, but doing the research, visiting the sites. Um, so we certainly um, were in agreement with this. I agree. I agree. Okay. All right. So this consent agenda? Yeah, we go with it's that? fine. Right. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Amy. Oh, oh did I skip somebody? Nope. Okay, um, my item on the uh, Committee of the Whole Agenda tonight is for the um, Illinois 7, Illinois 171 water main replacement. Um, this project is split up in the capital improvement plan as two separate projects. Um, however, um, they are scheduled in the same year and they're in close vicinity. And uh, we have the opportunity to have these completed as part of the state's uh, intersection improvement project, which will um, allow the city to save costs on restoration. Uh, we uh, 
contacted Strand for a proposal to put together the design for the project, which will be incorporated into the state's plans for the intersection improvement. And um, Strand's proposal is for an amount not to exceed $85,000. So my recommendation is going to be to in, enter into an agreement with Strand Associates um, to complete the plans and specifications for this water main replacement in the amount of $85,000. Um, that can be paid for the stub year budget or next year? Um, probably next year's budget. I mean, if, if, because it won't if be awarded until the next, this is Committee of the Whole, so it won't be awarded until the next City Council meeting, and that's when the contract will be yeah, awarded. Sure. So by the time they get, I mean, they may have a little bit that'll be paid out in this year, but. This is, this is for no, this is the last because it won't be awarded until January. So this is, this is for the 2016 project, uh, 20, 2017 project, wouldn't it be? Yeah, 2017. 2017. 2016. Okay. I don't have any problem with it. Any other questions? Is this uh, something we could be good with on a consent agenda? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay, um, and under new business, um, I have uh, Strand Associates here to present an update on the Garfield Street Reconstruction Project and also uh, the Reed Street Reconstruction Project that's proposed for next summer. All right, lay down a Strand. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, Council and Directors. Happy holidays to you guys. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I could just look down right here. So yeah, we're just going to, I'm Mark Riggis with Strand Associates. I was the project manager for the Garfield Avenue project. I'm also the project manager for the Reed Street project. Um, and we're just going to go through and give you a quick update, like Amy said, on both of these projects. Please interrupt us at any point if you do have any questions for us, and I promise I won't take too much of your time. So the Garfield Avenue project overview. Um, if you remember or not, it is federally funded with a surface transportation program funding, which besides for phase one um, planning engineering, the phase two engineering, phase three engineering, and the construction is an 80% federal, 20% city split with the project. And we did do phases uh, one, two, and three for it. The awarded construction cost was a little over a million dollars. Due to weather and utility conflicts, it's going to be completed um, in spring of 2015, and I'll go a little bit more into what needs to be completed at this point. Um, so this week, from speaking with the landscaper, they're going to be continuing to be laying down topsoil. They'll be putting down some temporary seed and erosion control blanket. The reason why we're doing that is we don't want to keep bare soil out there so when the snow starts to uh, melt or if it's raining, it's going to get the soil onto the driveway and the curb and gutter. So we want to keep things out there as clean as possible during the winter. You may be saying, why are you putting down seed right now? It's not going to grow. That's correct, but we do want to be prepared for in the spring, depending on when the contractor gets out there, that we do get to stabilize the ground a little bit for that. Um, and then in spring 2015, we'll have to pave um, the roadway surface course. It did get a little cold, as you all know, um, a little earlier than expected, so we weren't able to pave the surface course. We'll have to do pavement markings after that. There will be one asphalt driveway. Um, from our discussions with the city and the contractor, um, it was decided not to move forward with asphalt driveways um, with the residents that have current asphalt driveways because of the temperature and the concern about the product that was going to be given for that. So all the driveways are now concrete except for the <coughs> one resident that requested to get the asphalt driveway in the spring. Um, you may see a picture on top right here of some of these foundations that are sticking out of the ground. That is for some ornamental street lighting that's going to be put in. We just spoke with the manufacturer and they think they will be getting the street lights and the poles by um, February and March, is that correct? And then finally, they'll be putting down sod on the ground and they'll also be doing their tree planting program. Uh, the last picture I showed you right here is the, the East Parkway between 11th and 12th and we have some um, a row of trees and shrubs that are planned for that area <coughs> right there. Did you guys have any questions on Garfield? Number one, 
one was because they could be completed this year, and number two uh, is because the unit price for concrete driveways is actually cheaper than the unit price for asphalt driveways. So as long as the resident was in a concrete driveway, then we decided to put it in concrete. A whole new driveway, or just no, the apron? Just the apron. Okay. Just the apron to the right of way. Okay, well, moving on, I was gonna talk about the Re Street Reconstruction Project yes. in Lucky City. You guys did get a grant for this one, also surface transportation system for 80% federal funding and 20% city funding. It has an estimated construction cost of $1.7 million, and it's a roadway reconstruction from Division Street all the way up to um, 7th Street with uh, curb and gutter that will be barrier curb, and it'll be approximately the same width as the existing roadway is out there right now. Um, some of the things that we specifically wanted to do with this project is we knew from speaking with the city and from speaking with the residents that there was some sort of um, geometric constraints with one of the intersections at Reed Street and Putnam Drive. Um, it's not very ideal and it kind of comes in at a skewed angle as you can see with the picture right here looking southbound. Um, and the other picture is just a picture of a tree missing some of its trunk because it's been hit by a car. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at some of the um, alternative geometric configurations that we can do for this intersection to improve, this, improve the safety for it and reduce the accidents. And um, what we came up with is squaring up the intersection to make it a T intersection um, on a curve. So instead, if you're traveling southbound, uh, you almost it's just a straight curb and gutter that goes right into that person's house right there. When you're traveling southbound, the outside curb and gutter actually starts to curve to e hopefully ease the vehicle into the turn right there. Um, I, I have a question. Sure. So, so uh, we're, we're looking at, um, is this a white truck that's in the middle here? Is that what this is? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. The truck from the aerial is actually in an area that would be um, grass. And um, I know we've talked about, now that just for people know, I grew up, I grew up literally across the street from this intersection. Okay, and there have been hundreds of cars that have gone into um, the, uh, I think it's 1003 Reed. I grew up at 1002 Reed. Um, that have gone into the yard directly across the street from my mom and dad's house. Every tree that's ever been in the parkway has been destroyed there. And even back when I was much younger, a buddy of mine put a car on the front stoop of the house that across the street, beautiful cutlass. And um, so the concern has always been here, and I know the concern is of that resident, of that house is, um, especially now with brand new asphalt, it's gonna be a really fast track. How are we going to protect that house? And I know you and I have talked about a, a barrier, uh, rocks, trees, mm -hmm. something. Yeah, um, well, the first thing we wanna do is clean up the geometry at the intersection, so we think that helps out there. The second thing is that we're using the barrier curb that is six inches high, so when a car hits that, it. I wouldn't say it necessarily slows them down, but it's a big, big old thud that does thousands of dollars of damage to your car to slow it down. Uh, the third thing is that we are adding um, until Beacon Street lighting to the side street, so you can also see that the intersection is right there. The fourth thing is we're going to um, work with the city because the city procures the signing for the project. We'll work on revising some of the signing that's out there to um, alert vehicles as they go through there. And I believe I'm on the fifth thing is that we're going to have new pavement markings and raised reflective pavement markers along the curves there. Um, I know we talked about um, barriers and guardrails and all that. And the guardrail is a really tricky thing because if it's not warranted, it's, it's a hazard in itself. So if somebody hits it, a lot of times um, anybody that was involved with the guardrail uh, gets, gets involved with the lawsuit, you know, whether it was a drunk driver or not, because the guardrail is considered a barrier itself and can injure that. And we did look at this intersection. It wasn't warranted. Similar to what we did on Garfield, you had some very old <laughs> guardrails um, at 9th Street and Garfield in that southeast corner. 
um, that we took out and we did not replace it because it was not warranted in that Another area. question that, that, I, that was asked here is, is the uh, silver maple trees all along Reed Street were all planted between 1955 and 1968, 69, and they're all old and dead and rotten. Are we going to re be removing these? Because I sure would hate to go ahead and do all this work, and now we <coughs> have to come back and tear all these trees down. Yeah, I, we could definitely entertain that. There was on Garfield uh, an old silver maple that the resident requested be removed, and we did that. So if that's what you'd like to do, then Well, I, I, I will give you a specific address. But because uh, my parents, they actually took the two, two, two silver maples out of there and then and the, and the house to the, to the side. They also took theirs out because, you know, there's, you know a, a, a tree that was planted in 1965 was 15 years old then. So now we're, you know, we're at, it's at the end of the life of all the silver maples on Reed Street. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I would really encourage, and I say this to the 10 people who I think actually watch these things, is that if you live on the street and you guys send out the notices for the, um, the meetings, go to them. Because residents, they're invited to them. You get notices in the mail to come to the pre-planning of these things, and that's exactly when residents can bring up these concerns say my tree needs to go and, and this kind of stuff and the city's very um, amiable to that they, they work with the residents the problem that I've seen happen is when they don't Amy says this all the time we had a meeting one person showed up and then everybody goes bananas when the construction starts and oh what the heck's going on so it's very important that folks respond to those to those meetings this is the opportunity that we have to you know share with the city exactly the thoughts so and that's a good point because there's actually I believe it's January 8th, Thursday. So we have notices been sent out in the mail to all the residents the week before the door hangers will be distributed throughout to remind everybody. No, that's good. No, I know you always make the effort. I just. This is going to be the second one. Yeah. The first one was not as well attended. It was a foggy day. Right. So we wanted to make sure we got in the second one. Okay. Well, good. Thank you for being diligent on it. Mm hmm. So some of the other improvements we'll be doing um, that aren't typical is there is uh, some sidewalk that we're going to be extending and adding to the corridor, as seen in the yellow line right here. We are all really focusing um, along this corridor during the project as there's a lot of steep driveways along the east side. So um, we're going to be doing raising the roadway profile so it isn't as steep. We'll also be making all the sidewalks that are crossing the driveways. Those are also steep with the driveway too. They'll be ADA accessible now and not be exceeding um, that cross slope for it. And then finally, as I discussed um, at Putnam, all the intersections will have beacon ornamental street lighting on the minor leg of it. And that's just a picture of what's also being installed um, in Garfield once it comes in in 2015. Are we doing street lighting that's consistent with other street lighting we have? Um, we try to uh, make it as close to the acorn lining that we have in the new subdivisions as possible, but I got will not allow the. They, they, they consider it, uh, they call it a glare bomb. Yeah. So they don't really allow that. What they do, as you see right here, is, is the cutoff head where all the light is shining down onto the roadway and not glaring out. So, oh, so we, did, we did try to match that. No, that's good. At least is there some consistency with the bases and stuff. So that's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to ask Brian. Brian, will you help me? Um, do my best, there. To, I know that. <laughs> I know, and I need a lot of help. But, <laughs> but since, since, since Brian grew up two blocks away from me, we, we know just about everybody on, on Reed Street, and maybe we can go ahead and knock on some doors and say, hey, you need to get to this meeting on January 8th. Please. Mm -hmm. That is, the, I mean, the reason on Garfield that you don't have sidewalk on the west side is it was in there, and then we had a second meeting, and the residents said, take it out. So if we didn't have that second meeting and we didn't have that input, they would have had sidewalk in front of their house, and 
maybe have been upset after the fact. Now, ironically, I think they won't say. All right. Anything else, uh, guys? So I just want to talk a little bit about the federally funded project schedule. Um, we just completed phase one and we're moving into phase two, which is design and the contract documents and construction, um, engineering and actual construction is phase three. So I'll talk a little bit more about our remaining anticipated schedule. You know, we all understand that the roadways falling apart. It's been falling apart for years and we're patching it. Um, we just received the notice to proceed last week, so we're on a very quick time frame on getting these plans out to um, IDOT. And as we previously discussed, January 8th will be another open house for you, um, and final plans will be forwarded to IDOT um, in March. Um, the advertising for IDOT is going to be between May and June and will be awarded in July. Um, we did talk to IDOT about um, how important it is that the city gets this project completed. This year, for several reasons, they said they're going to work with us to expedite awarding the contract to the contractor. So we feel like he will begin in August and get the project um, completed this year. So I just wanted to kind of show you this schedule because when you're dealing with the federal funds, you know, the city and Strand, we're done in March. There's a five month period until the contractor can actually get out there with all the advertisements and the paperwork that IDOT and FHWA does. Yeah. The problems of getting money from the man, right? Yep. Okay. And we had originally anticipated an April letting for the project, which would allow us to start in June. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yes. that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So we are That's it. Any other questions? I'll make a comment saying uh, thanks, Mark, for your, your work. And uh, I know uh, projects seem to be moving pretty good. I haven't heard too many complaints. So Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I know we were talking before the residents on Garfield have <laughs> yeah. been even helpful with us. So yeah. it's, it's been right. a pleasure working with them. And Kyle, Kyle has been doing a good job working with thanks. them. Thanks to both you guys for that, too. And also, I want to say thanks to our engineering department, too. Uh, it sounds like they've been doing some good information some door hangers, so that's very helpful with our projects we have. And thanks to Amy for a lot of the grant writing she does, and thanks to her critiquing uh, how she does them, we were able to get those. So thanks, Amy, again, uh, and, and, and the whole engineering department, because they're out in the field looking at things too, so we know they work very hard at getting all that done. So thanks. Yeah, we'll try to figure out ways to uh, keep pressure on the utilities. I find that that's been the biggest bane is uh, their they kind of roll out of bed late apparently every morning so we can uh try to figure out ways to keep pressure on them because they've held up most of the project so mm -hmm. okay all right anything else yeah, just a quick comment i thought the uh roxy event you know pam was there and uh, darren and so many others at the i thought it went beautifully it was an interactive movie of white christmas where the audience sang along and actually had the the bells and chimes, it was just fantastic. I had a blast. I saw Dennis, he was uh, covering, uh, covering the events, and I was really amazed at the work of our third ward alderman, Darren Deskin, playing uh, Santa Claus, my nine-year-old. First thing she says, hey, it's Darren. <laughs> goes, I recognize his glasses. He didn't play Susu, so you were caught. <laughs> Fantastic, beautiful no, job. It's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. And you know, well, it was kind of everything was temporary facades, temporary things. You know, we're gonna to try to work with um, Trinity who's been extremely helpful and cooperative with allowing, you know, the use of the building. And so I'm gonna to try to get to, together with them here um, and look about doing some permanent fixes inside um, so that we can continue this, this trend, which has been a lot of fun, so. Thanks. And uh, Darren wanted me to let everybody know he's available for Santa Claus uh, mm -hmm. for hire. So. <laughs> <laughs>
no, I'm not reasonable rates. No, 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 I'm not. No, not for hire. I'll do just. That's right. Oh, just for free. Yeah, he was singing there too. Uh, I have something oh, go ahead. I just wanted to bring up. Um, I've heard a lot, I've gotten complaints from people that said that they never got their letters to renew their vehicle stickers. Okay. And, um, you know, I told them, well, get over there quickly because the fees go up in January if you didn't get one. Um, I mentioned it to the chief, and, and he said that he's heard that too. And I was wondering if perhaps uh, he said he's going, that they're going to post. Uh, one of those signs out on the road about it we had it in front of the police station for a month and it is now we just put it this week by uh, by the Pizza Hut on 9th Street we can move it again too so. but I was just wondering if it would be possible if we could delay the fines a month since the letters didn't go out and make them not increase till February there you go. I got my letter. They even nailed me on my Indian. So well, I got mine uh, too. So, but I, I don't have a problem with that. It's everyone's okay. It's fine with me. Yeah. Yeah. We can extend mm -hmm. that out a month for a month. Yeah, yeah. to the end of January. I just want to uh, add one thing. This evening, uh, this evening is uh, Ron Caniva's last meeting, and we're supposed to applaud. <laughs> 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 I've, I've known Ron since 1995, and uh, it, there's. No more fun guy to debate with than Ron, and um, he's a uh, a wealth of knowledge. And um, anybody that thinks they know it all, then they need to talk to Ron because he does. <laughs> so, but I, I just uh, a great man, and uh, the city's definitely going to miss him. Our replacement for Ron is uh, also good. Don't get me wrong, but um, but Ron. <laughs> But uh, Ron Caniva is uh, just a, a, a jewel that uh, is going to be missed and a uh, great guy. And Ron never stays mad. I mean, you can have a mm -hmm. discussion with him, but he, <laughs> the next minute he's fine. So, but, uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I, like, well, well said, Kelly. Uh, you, uh -huh. Ron, you'll, you'll be missed, and uh, I'm glad you're still around and, you know, not like you're leaving town. So Isn't he going to be here the 7th? Yes. Okay. Yes, we get to embarrass him. That's yeah, what we'll I thought. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Ron, thank you. We get to get we get to give him the sundial for all that you, that you can put on his wrist. You're not gonna get a watch. <laughs> all right, meeting adjourned. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. All right, so we're gonna have a motion to, uh, so to adjourn. So moved. Oh, I'm, did, was there anything else? That was it, right? Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, so moved. Uh, I don't even know who said it. Second. Loretta seconded. I think uh, Kelly oh, first did it. Whatever. Uh, all in favor? First did it. Aye. All right. We'll uh, move you right on to uh, city council. If you don't mind, do another roll call while like, I bring it up. How's that? Sure. Coretta? Here. Marinowski? Here. Vandermeer? Deskin? Here. Turner? Here. Smith? Here. Lorelli? Here. Capadona? Six present. All right. Uh, first thing up is uh, may I have a uh, uh, motion to have a consent agenda? So moved. Second. Alderman Turner, seconded by Alderman Peretta. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, basically we have the uh, regular city council meeting minutes from December 3rd, the committee of the whole meeting minutes from December 3rd. We have our payroll ending December 7th. There's approval of bills. Any questions? Okay, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Alderman Turner, second by Alderman Deskin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, now this, what do you got? Uh, yes, I just need approval to, um, a motion to approve the January 2015 monthly meeting calendar. So moved. Second. Alderman Turner, Alderman Peretta. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the second thing that I have is uh, I need a motion to approve the executive session meeting minutes from December 3rd, uh, 2014 as presented. So moved. Second. Alderman Turner, Alderwoman Marinowski. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No, uh, Peretta. Peretta. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Uh, dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Big Ben. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of the Council, I will be seeking a motion to pass a resolution approving the proposed Central Square budget for 2015. Um, we had the uh, same annual assessment of $80,000 a year, which was placed in the 2015 budget allocations. Um, this should uh, or will um, take the organization through the entire year of 2015 
um, for operations, including uh, the roof fixes that are proposed um, in that budget, utilizing some of the fund balances. Um, actually, uh, I've been asked uh, and, and have accepted to take the role of chair of that organization next year to allow the past chair, Ron Alberico, to spend a little bit more time on his relocation efforts. Um, and we'll be uh, bringing those reports to you quarterly. All right. We want to make a motion. So moved. Alderman Turner. Second. second. Was that a second? Yes. Okay, second. seconded by Alderman Mary now. Any, uh, any discussion? Okay. We have a, a vote? Yes. Maranowski? Yes. Vandermeer? Deskin? Yes. Turner? Yes. Smith? Yes. Tallarelli? Yes. Six yes. Motion carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item I have, Mayor, is uh, we'll be uh, looking for a couple different action here. It's a joint application for a new Des Plaines River Valley Enterprise Zone. Um, back in 83, the Des Plaines River <coughs> Zone um, was a big part of Illinois' economic development strategy. Um, the initial zone was for 20-year period. We've had several extensions. Uh, one was a 10-year in 2003. We also had a three-year extension um, back in uh, 2013. Joliet, Lockport, Rockdale, Romaville, and Will County uh, have partnered in this effort. Um, basically, uh, to sum it up, it, it's a new application. However, we are essentially following um, the same standards and, and borders and zones that we had previously. So, and in other words, it's really another 15-year extension, but we have to start all over again. Um, we did have a meeting. The, the joint group with Joliet, Lockport, Rockdale, and Romeville and Will County um, on Monday, December 8th, uh, 8th of this year. It was also published in the The group agreed to go ahead and continue this arrangement. Uh, in order to do that, um, each of the municipalities participating will have to uh, pass this um, action before you tonight. Um, the county will be doing theirs tomorrow night, um, and we have to have the full application submitted before the end of the year. Um, so I'm looking for a motion to pass an ordinance to, with the establishment of the Enterprise Zone subject to the Enterprise Zone Act of the State of Illinois. So moved. Second. Hey, uh, there's a chorus over here. Of, um, I think uh, Deskin, or not Deskin. No, not me. Alderman Corelli and uh, Alderman Smith, either one of them. Yeah. No. No, it was <laughs> Turner and Colorado. Turner and Colorado. They kind of chimed on at right. like, the exact same time. It was amazing. It's yes. a rut. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Roll call. Why don't you take a roll call? You want to do a roll call? Okay. Yeah. Roll call, please. Loretta? Yes. Yes. Skin? Yes. Turner? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Colorelli? Yes. Six yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, the second uh, part of this is a motion to pass the ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute an intergovernmental agreement between the parties of the City of Joliet, City of Lockport, Village of Rockdale, Village of Romeoville, and the County of Will regarding the Des Plaines River Valley Enterprise Zone. So moved. Second. All right. Alderman Turner, seconded by Alderman Smith. Another roll call? Coretta? Yes. Aronofsky? Yes. Vandermeer? Absent. Sorry. Deskin? Yes. Turner? Yes. Smith? Yes. Calarelli? Yes. Six days, motion carried. Okay, thank you. you have a oh, I do, yes. I'm sorry, thank you. We do have an uh, executive session request under personnel tonight. All right, Lisa. Um, tonight on the agenda is the approval of the property tax levy for 2014, uh, ordinance number 14-034. On November 19th, I presented the uh, levy to the council, uh, which included a CPI increase of 1.5% and the 2.5 million in estimated new AV, EAV. Um, the EAV for the city did drop $5 million to an estimated 566 million. The total levy for corporate and special purposes was uh, 5,477,000 with another 860,000 of debt service for a total levy of $6,337,000. A little break revenue itself, uh, the increase in the revenue was gonna be about a $90,000 increase over the prior year's property tax levy. And the breakdown of that is um, the new property was gonna bring another 61,000 to the city and the CPI increase uh, of 1.5% was gonna bring $29,000 of additional so I'm seeking uh, approval of that levy. It is due to be submitted to the county by next Tuesday. So moved. Second. 
Alderman Colorelli, seconded by Alderman uh, Deskin. Any words before we go? Okay, can I have a roll call, Alice? Peretta? Yes. Maranowski? No. Deskin? Yes. Turner? No. Smith? Yes. Colorelli? Yes. And, um, we have and the mayor can vote? The mayor can vote. Four, yes. half yes. the mayor council votes, members yes. voted in the affirmative. Okay. So mayor votes yes. Five yeays. Motion carried. All right, what else you got? My next item is uh, a resolution for investment with MB Financial Bank. Um, the city is looking to diversify some of its investments that we have. Uh, these are short-term investments because we're doing a lot of capital improvement projects, but uh, in order to diversify our revenue, our uh, investments a little bit, I'm looking to open up a new um, investment with MB Financial Bank. Um, you know, it's under my authority to go ahead and uh, open an investment, but this bank did require the council to uh, approve this resolution. So I'm, I'm seeking approval for the investment so moved. with MB Financial. Alderman Turner, anyone second? Second. Alderman Smith, second. Uh, just do a, a roll call, please. Ask a question, though. Yes. Is this a liquid account? Yes, so, absolutely. Okay. And it's fully collateralized. I assume, yeah. Okay. okay. Nothing else? We'll do roll call. Coretta? Okay. Yes. Baranowski? Yes. Deskin? Yes. Turner? Yes. Smith? Yes. Colorelli? Yes. Six A's. Motion carry. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Um, moving on to Pam. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, the agenda placement of Shop Local um, Business Spotlight campaign was passed back in April of 2009. Um, over the past year, um, I've been working with local businesses to determine additional means for them to be able to um, advertise and promote their businesses. Um, recognizing businesses Shop Local, Local Business Spotlight provides them an opportunity um, for them to come make a brief commercial-like presentation uh, of who they are, where they are, what kind of uh, business they have to offer. And staff would like to reestablish that program. Uh, however, what we would like to do is begin in January 2015. Instead of having it limited to uh, only one of the meetings or two many of the whole workshop agenda a month, I would like to be able to have it run regularly scheduled community as a whole. What that would mean is I would schedule approximately two to three businesses who would come and make a presentation of between two and three minutes to the council. And what's nice is once they make that presentation based on the schedule that LCTV has for replaying uh, community of the whole meeting, it will provide additional advertising for these businesses um, in morning um, when it's aired and also some evenings when it's aired as well. Um, I'm asking you to consider this change without committee of the whole discussion because it was a program that was originally established and because of the interest and excitement amongst the businesses that I've talked to about reestablishing it, I would like to be able to make sure that we can start by the community of the well, In addition, I would just like to change the title a little bit from Shop Local to Shop Lock Court Business Spotlight. Um, and then what I hope to do is uh, over the year, similar to like what we just recently did with Shop um, for Small Business Saturday, is expand the program to other opportunities for businesses to get the word out about who they are. So with that being said, uh, I would uh, ask that the City Council um, make a motion to pass ordinance number 14039, which basically states an ordinance amendment chapter 34A, entitled Street Council Workshop Meeting, and by deleting that chapter, shop local business spotlight in its entirety and adding it to each regular agenda of the community as a whole. So moved. Second. Okay. Alderman Turner, seconded by Alderwoman Mary Nowski. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And next, next month, the businesses that will be presented will be Hollywood Candy, Old Town Cafe, and All right, great. I know a law firm that's got a a brand new lawyer that will use the Okay, um, on the agenda tonight, I have the Illinois 7 Thornton Street Intersection Improvement Project recommendation for approval of past at number three. 
and uh, this is going to require a Board of Local Improvements meeting, so we'll have to go into a, a Board of Local Improvements meeting. Um, before we get to that, um, I would actually like to go through um, an update, a project update that um, was sent to me uh, by Robinson Engineering yesterday. Um, I had planned on uh, emailing this out to the City Council before the meeting tonight, um, but I just got it yesterday. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Work completed to date on the Illinois uh, 7 Thornton Street intersection improvement includes uh, the storm sewer construction is completed, the water main relocations are completed, the south retaining wall is completed, the pavement widening and curb and gutter is completed to the base level and temporary pavement markings are installed. Concrete driveways have been completed and the traffic signal work has been initiated. Uh, work that is still anticipated um, prior to winter shutdown includes uh, continuing the traffic signal installation and these work tasks will partially be dependent upon weather, weather conditions. Uh, preliminary uh, roadway punch list work to prepare for winter shutdown of work activities and the contractor is to maintain the pavement and temporary signage throughout the winter season. The remaining project timeline is the pavement grinding and final uh, resurfacing uh, completion date target is May 1st of 2015. Uh, the traffic signal turn on and punch list work target completion is June 15th and the construction budget of $2.25 million um, is still projected as a good estimate. So we're still within the budget. Um, outstanding issues uh, include the resolution of potential extra work for private driveway reconstruction pro uh, near the west end of the project. We had an issue with um, Tish, the pawn shop uh, owner, and his driveway and we met with them out there we got a, a quote from deconstruction for tying in the driveway to the curb and gutter where the project ends and uh, that will be completed in the spring as well so um you want to just since we do this simultaneously yeah. just <coughs> make a motion to open up the board of local improvements meeting as well I'll make that motion to open the Board of a Local Improvements meeting. Okay. Second. Second, second by Alderman Marineski. Welcome. <laughs> All right, so. So uh, the, the motion for the Board of Local Improvements and the City Council is to accept the payout and you want to. Right. Uh, a memo was uh, provided in your packet uh, and the, the actual uh, pay estimate uh, amount was wrong on the, me the original memo. Um, so a revised memo was emailed out to all the city council members. The actual amount of pay estimate number three is $807,741.54. And uh, our recommendation is to approve pay estimate number three uh, to deconstruction in the amount of $807,741.54. A motion to uh, make that payment. Second. Okay. Uh, right. All in favor? Uh, now, do we, we have to? to do we have to approve it first? Yeah. You yeah. are. So you guys are. Yeah. Okay. So the three of us. Both in aye. favor is in agreement. So yes. Okay. Aye. <laughs> or you can roll call it. Both eyes are yes. Both, okay. both eyes are yes. <laughs> okay. Aronofsky. Yes. Teskin. Yes. And Mayor. And then we uh, do a yeah. city yes. council. Yes. He's not gonna and a motion to adjourn. I will make the motion to adjourn the Board of Local Improvements meeting. Right. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Magically, we're back at city council. And do we need to do anything else? Or why don't you make this just even though it's a Board of Local Improvements meeting, since the city council is putting a substantial amount of money as their contribution, it okay. would be wise just to have them. Yep. Authorize the passage as well. All right. I have one more question. Yes. Amy, completion date, you said June 15th, correct? Uh, completion date for the roadway improvements is uh, in May, and then for the turn on of the traffic signal would be June 15th. Okay, so May and then June 15th is yeah. what you're talking about. The, the signal of equipment will probably be up quite a bit before then, right. um, but we all know how long it takes to get IDOT okay. to schedule yeah. a turn on. So I just want to make sure I heard you right because, yeah, okay. Thank you. So do we need another motion? Yeah, we'll just yeah. vote on so it. So I'll make the motion to accept the recommendations of the Board of Local Improvements to pay this bill. Okay. 
I have a second. 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 Okay, so it's Alderman Deskin, seconded by Alderman Collarelli. Can I have a roll call? Coretta? Yes. Maranowski? Yes. Deskin? Yes. Turner? Yes. Smith? Yes. Collarelli? Yes. 68, motion carried. All right. Thank you, Amy. All right, anything else? New business? Nothing else? Okay. Um, can I have a motion to go into executive session? Go no moved. Recess and go. Recess. 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 Yeah, for, yeah, if you see one, I think it is. All right. Um, so I have a motion by Alderman Turner. Second. Second by Alderman Deskin. All favor? Aye. 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 All right, let's just take a couple minutes to clear the chamber and. We'll